Are you ready for the chilling truth about what beast worship will be like in the tribulation? It is a point of no return. Would you know the worship of the beast if you even saw it taking place in front of your eyes? Are you sure you'll recognize it and are you sure you won't do it? I bet you're imagining rows of thousands bowing down to be Antichrist and you're thinking, yeah, I'll know it when I see it. But is there more to it than that? I remember my time as a missionary in Africa and dealing with the witch doctors there. There is some level of similarity, so let me tell you this story. There was an obvious pagan worship that took place over there, animal sacrifices and the like. But there was also a subtle type. The people that believed that if a witch doctor touched you, they could curse you. One day, the local witch doctor stepped into my medical clinic, and all my assistants, who were churchgoers, backed up against the walls. They were scared to death. Many were literally shaking. They were acknowledging the power of the demons. So to me, I stood up, walked over to the witch doctor, stuck out my hand, and he shook it. It was a great teaching moment. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. That story has application for what we'll see in the near future. This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters, and in this video, we're going to look at what the Bible says worship is, what worship of the beast looks like in Revelation and in Daniel, and how those watching this video, who are still alive at that time, should react to those things when they face them in the future. And of course, worship of the beast is an eternally damnable sin. Anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on the forehead or hand, he also will drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Yikes. Not what anyone would ever want, a ticket to the lake of fire. So this is a crucial topic because there is no repentance once you do this. So knowing what worship of the beast is, is incredibly important. The passage gives no wiggle room for repentance at all. So this sin is unlike any other sin. And we need to keep that in mind. And for this video, we'd like to give a shout out to Richard Longacre, who researched this for us. That's what this channel is all about. We're a channel that focuses on exposing things you don't get elsewhere like this teaching, and we're a community. The Holy Spirit works through all believers. So if you have an idea for a video, let us know. So what do you think worship entails? Singing in church, speaking the attributes of God, worshiping by giving and offering? Let's see what the New Testament says. The Greek word for worship, as found in Revelation, is proskunio, which literally means to kiss the ground when bowing down to a superior. The idea of a kiss is important. The ancient Egyptians used to blow kisses to their gods. At its base meaning then, it is making all necessary physical gestures. Obviously, it's also used in a non-literal way for showing reverence to God, even without the body gestures as we do in churches today, you know, lifting hands. It can be offerings, religious service like singing, speaking an oath, or our human response to a gracious God, thankfulness for what the God, or in our case, our true God, has done for us. Worship of the beast will be similar. If we look at how Muslims worship in today's world, we might get an idea of what beast worship will look like because it matches what the Bible describes as beast worship almost exactly. So let's consider what they do. Muslims start their worship experience when they convert to Islam. Conversion requires they take an oath, the Shahada. You've probably heard this. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And then it's followed by circumcision afterward, and that's just considered a custom, though, by the Shia. And I think beast worship will be just like this, taking an oath and having a physical mark 
probably the mark of the beast placed on your body. The beast oath will probably be very similar to this Muslim oath, pledging that there is no God but the Antichrist and that the false prophet is his messenger. Every Muslim is also required to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at some point in their lives as a form of sacrifice. Now, will pilgrimage to the beast's home city be required for all those that worship the beast? Well, maybe that could be similar as well. Muslims are also required to pray a prayer called the Selah five times a day. At the same time, they bow their heads to the ground, just like the word proscunio. In Muslim areas, loudspeakers usually call the faithful to prayer. In the future, I can imagine that when beast worship begins worldwide, cell phones will do the announcement call to prayer at a loud volume, sort of like an amber alert, in addition to loudspeakers. After I realized this, I've started to cringe a bit every time I hear one of those phone alerts. And it very well may be that those alive at that time are all forced to bow in reverence to the beast during daily prayers of some sort. Now, this prayer might sound biblically familiar to you. In the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar built his statue of gold, or as he called it, the image of gold, he had all the government officials gathered to worship it. This is found in Daniel 3. At the king's signal, an orchestra of musicians played a call to worship. Then all were required to bow to the image upon penalty of death. The statue was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and six types of instruments played the music. Hmm. Six, six, six. God is clearly signaling that this event is a foreshadow of what's coming. I'm sure you know the rest of the story. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to worship the image, and the king cast them into a fiery furnace, stoked, catch this, seven times hotter than usual a symbol of the seven-year, 70th week of Daniel. But in spite of this, they didn't die. Instead, a divine being, likely Jesus, appeared in the fire with the three Hebrew boys, and they were spared. Based on this, Nebuchadnezzar was converted to faith in the one true God. And if you noticed, it was an image that the people bowed down to, not to the king himself. This is also a foreshadow because it is the image of the beast that people in the future will worship. And it, the false prophet, was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Revelation 13, 14 through 15. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so what this image is like is important so that we can recognize it. We'll look at that and the options for it in just a moment. But first, I want to go back to what the angel of God said were the sins associated with beast worship, the eternally damnable sins. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on the forehead or hand. Okay, so there were three things. Worship of the beast worship of its image, and the taking of a physical mark of the beast on the hand or forehead. So, did you notice it's all three? It's not just one. So the Bible is telling us these three things are interrelated. In fact, beast worship is always linked to the mark. Taking the mark is part of the worship. This is parallel to what current Islamic worship is like. Worship of the false god by saying the oath, then taking a physical mark, showing that you belong to the God, circumcision in the case of the Muslims, and the mark of the beast in the future. And then, probably, ongoing worship of the image of the beast, like the bowing and praying that happens five times a day. Now, let me say something, because it's very important. Islamic worship is not beast worship. Let me stress that. Islamic worship isn't beast worship, and people can and do repent and convert to Christianity. It happens all the time. But God has likely given us this type of worship as a picture, a foreshadow, 
of what may take place in the future. So what is different with beast worship that makes it damnable? What makes it so you cannot repent from it? On this channel, we think that it's that mark. If the mark changes your DNA so you're no longer truly human, very likely, or it is some sort of brain interface that changes your ability to think for yourself, also possible, then in either case, you become unredeemable. So just taking that mark is a point of no return. And it is very likely that taking the mark is made part of taking that oath in the future. What might that look like? What we're going to say now is just supposition. But imagine yourself in the following scenario. The beast's armed followers round up all the people in your town and herd them into the town's athletic field. Maybe it's your high school football field. We're in a big city. Maybe it's Mile High Stadium in Denver, Cowboys Stadium in Dallas. Everybody gets into a big line to enter. You know, the kind of line that you have for a concert or an athletic event in the line. Everyone has been starving. There's been a famine for months. And many have been sick with the new deadly virus. By this point, everyone has heard that this beast is a savior and will provide food for everyone who worships him and will upgrade your DNA to make you immortal. So you don't have to worry about that virus. Everyone has also heard that resources on earth are very limited. So those refusing to take this mark will be eliminated. The government says we can't waste resources or food on those who aren't part of the solution. The line slowly files into the stadium. At the front of the stadium is a big stage, and to the right hand is a row of guillotines, <laughs> and you know what they're for. A spokesperson spends 15 minutes praising the beast for saving the world. He then explains that the image of the beast will be revealed to you, and you will say the oath, bow down, and then you will be given the opportunity to take the mark, and thus be able to buy food, and most importantly, they tell you your DNA will be upgraded, and you will be immortal, just like the beast who came back to life or appeared to come back to life. It is the moment of decision. Those not bowing will be eliminated. The woman in front of you just faints. You try to revive her, but you're pushed out of the way by the guards, and they just drag her away. The official then says the oath and asks the giant crowd to repeat it, saying, The beast is the only God, and the false prophet is his prophet. You hear the massive crowd repeating the oath, word by word. Then the call to worship is played, sort of like a Gregorian chant of some kind, and the image of the beast walks onto the stage. Bow, the official says. Now, you've already made up your mind to refuse, and you pray to God silently as the crowd around you drops to the ground. Out of the three or four thousand on the field, there are only a few dozen still standing. The guards grab you and drag you away with the others, brave enough to refuse. At the guillotines, they give you one last chance to take the mark. You notice that about a third of those that get dragged over there have changed their mind and they're taken somewhere else. The others are placed on the guillotine and beheaded. Chop, chop, chop. The next thing you know, the angel of God is lifting your spirit off the earth. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Now everyone's still on earth, living in the cities and towns, will likely face that day. Some will escape to the mountains, but most on earth were going to face it, the day of decision. Faith or no faith. Worship of the beast isn't something you can be tricked into doing by taking a shot, digital ID, or digital currency. These are only precursors of it. People will know exactly what they're doing when they worship the beast. And as we mentioned on our channel several times, this is crucial to Satan. It is his ultimate end-time plan. If there are no genetic humans on the planet left, or 
no one to cry out to Jesus for him to return, he won't return, and Satan will continue to rule the world. So this division of everyone, either into beast worshipers or those that he's going to eliminate, is Satan's plan. Get rid of everyone who isn't on Satan's side. And once the division happens, Satan will likely continue to reinforce this worship of the beast through singing of songs, feasts, celebrations, and daily calls to public prayer. Refusal to do any of these acts of worship of the image of the beast will likely result in death. So we've mentioned this image of the beast. What is it? What is the image of the beast? We read in Revelation 13 that the false prophet commands the people of the earth to make an image. So it's physically constructed. It's man-made, most likely a technology. Revelation 13 says the false prophet is allowed by God to give the image of the beast breath and to speak. Now, the Greek word for breath is pneuma, which can also mean spirit. In fact, in the New Testament, 97% of the time, this word is translated as spirit, not breath. And I have to ask you, if it's a constructed thing, why is it breathing? Well, maybe if it's a cyborg, parts could be added to an existing being like the Antichrist, but that's about the only possibility. So what is it? There are several ideas. One is what we said above, that the Antichrist is injured. We know that from Scripture. And new parts are added to him. Maybe even his brain is connected to a computer. So that's idea one. Another possibility is that the false prophet constructs an AI, which becomes conscious and is given a spirit. And the AI would be based on the brain of the Antichrist and maybe the spirit is an evil spirit. Can an evil spirit possess an AI? Well, how do we know that it can't? Third possibility is it's embodied AI. AI placed in a human-looking robot, or even thousands of robots who are placed in cities all over the world, all looking and speaking like the Antichrist and linked to a central AI computer controlled by the beast. In all three cases, they would be the image of the beast. And in all three cases, they have some AI or computer interface. You have to remember that Satan and the Antichrist are not omnipresent or omniscient. They don't know everything and they aren't everywhere. So they need technology to help give them control over the whole earth. But at its core, Altering a person's DNA is the essence of beast worship to prove that you are Satan's DNA creation rather than God's DNA creation. This is the ultimate act of worshiping the beast, being willing to alter your DNA and become a creation of Satan rather than a creation of God. That's worship at its core. It is the part you can't repent from or undo. It's been Satan's plan from the beginning to alter DNA. He did it with the Nephilim, and he did it at the Tower of Babel. Uh, what are we saying at the Tower of Babel? Yes. Click right here to see how Nimrod, Satan's original version of the Antichrist, was likely a DNA-altered being according to the Bible and according to ancient records that support this. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.